Hi, Gunning Bedford. This is Mrs. Eisenberg from 7A, and I'm going to read you the second half of chapter five, pages 92 through 98 in Ghost. Nothing is wrong with it, not to me and you, but to them, oh, they look at me like some kind of letdown. You know what they call this place? Charlie's Little Store, he said, his voice now more serious, Little. Don't ever let someone call your life, your dreams, Little. Hear me? I nodded. He continued, all fired up. Because while they're out there sniffing their own butts, I get to hang out with a big man like you, a future world's greatest. And that's cool, Mr. Charles smiled, big, warm. So we got a deal? No more skipping school? No more skipping school, I agreed all quick. He lifted his hand from the bag, but before I could take it, he slapped his hand back down on it. You're not just saying that to get the seeds, are you? He asked, now glaring. Nah, man, for real, no more skipping school. He let go of the sunflower seeds and I snatched the bag before he changed his mind again. But I didn't breeze on out of the store like I normally do. I was still kind of paranoid about being busted by the cops and slammed up against a wall and searched and caught with fancy running shoes in my backpack and thrown in jail where the cafeteria food is worse than my schools and the hospitals. So I just hung around the store eating seeds while Mr. Charles went through his inventory. He had just gotten a drop off of new stuff. Soda, chips, cleaning products, cereal. You can't just hang out here, Castle. I mean, you're my guy. But you see that sign? Mr. Charles pointed to the one in the window. No loitering. Ain't nobody loitering. You don't see me just spitting seeds on your floor or nothing like that. I protested. I opened my hand so he could see that I had been spitting them into my palm. No, not littering, loitering, Mr. Charles said, ripping open a box. It means you can't just stand around. Oh, well, you want me to help you with some of these boxes? I asked, hoping he'd say yes, because the only other place I could go was a bus stop, and that was too out in the open. Either that or, or the track, but I was going to end up there later anyway. And after yesterday, I wasn't going down for another double practice. Plus, if the cops were out looking for a kid who stole track shoes, they might show up where the kid might be using them. So it was best not to be there in the middle of the day alone. Mr. Charles studied me for a moment, then thrust a box of cat food in my arm. Here, help me unpack this. The process was simple. There should be five of everything everywhere, which was really just a weird way for Mr. Charles to keep track of the store looking neat for a weird way for Mr. Charles to keep the store looking neat and organized and also an easy way for him to know if people were stealing from him. So for instance, in the fridge, there should be five of every soda, five of every juice, and on the cereal shelves, there need to be five of every kind of cereal, even the nasty ones that taste like dirt until you put sugar on them. Same went for chips and cookies, so my job was to look around the store and mis let Mr. Charles know what was missing. We need two orange juices, I said, thumbing through the juices like I was looking for a shirt in the coldest closet ever. Mr. Charles, as usual, didn't hear me. I looked over. He was reading another piece of paper. This time, it was one that he pulled from a box. I think it was like a receipt or something to tell him what he was supposed to do, have in each carton. He never even looked up. He didn't hear me at all. Dang. I wonder what it must be like to be hard of hearing. I bet gunshots sound like knocks on the door, which is a scary thought. Sheesh. Anyway, I repeated myself louder. Mr. Charles! This time he looked up. We need two orange juices, Mr. Charles nodded and pulled two from the box and handed them to me. Of course, while we were doing all this, I kept my eye on my backpack. I'd set it down in the corner at the back of the store and every time we'd restock some of the cookies or some dishwashing liquid, I would double check to make sure it was still there and that my sweet silver babies were still safe. After counting and restocking was done, Mr. Charles asked me to move all the leftovers into the stock room. No problem, I said, struggling to get a grip on the sides of one of the bigger cardboard boxes. Is there any order you want me to put them in? Nope, said Mr. Charles, wiping down the counter. Just stack it all up there towards the back so I can get in there and move around. That's all. One by one, I picked up boxes of ramen noodles, six packs of beers, a case of Worcestershire sauce, Worcestershire, Worcestershire, 
got to be the world's record for the hardest word, and moved them into the staff room. Mr. Charles seemed to have relaxed and was now standing behind the counter, staring at his old TV again, and that made me feel kind of good. Like I was doing something to help the old man out. I mean, he had always been so cool to me, such a good dude. It felt nice to be able to do something for him. Plus, he was getting up there in age. He even had that weird, flappy, turkey neck thing. So lifting these boxes was probably getting pretty hard for him. The sixth, or was it the seventh box, was the heaviest. It was filled with gallons of water, which was crazy because it just doesn't seem like water should be that heavy. I mean, it's clear, like air, and air don't weigh nothing. I couldn't even really lift the box. I just kind of held it, my arms straight, and did the caveman walk to the stock room, bumping into everything, including the stock room door, hoping I'd make it there before my shoulders popped out of the sockets. The door closed behind me. I dropped the box and used my feet to slide it across the room over to the other boxes, and then I stopped for the first time, had a look around. I can't tell you that I remembered anything about what the stock room looked like when me and my mom hid in it but I know we were in the corner, a corner where there was now a coat rack. I remember that me and Ma huddled there, right there, up against the wall, her holding me by the face, her hands covering my ears. Now when I think about it, I think she did that so that I wouldn't hear her crying or breathing hard, even though I could feel her chest rising and falling at the exact same pace of my own thumping heart. But I don't remember there being any boxes. I don't remember the desk and file drawers, the clock on the wall, or the $5 bill hanging in a frame. It all might have been there, but I just don't remember seeing it. And looking at it then, gazing around the room, I didn't really feel nothing, like no emotions, until I tried to open the door. It wouldn't budge. I tried again. The knob turned, but the door wouldn't come loose. I knocked lightly, trying not to panic. But of course, Mr. Charles couldn't hear me. He was probably deep into his cowboy flick. And he was on the other side of the store. And on top of that, he was practically deaf. So I banged, still nothing. Then I started tripping. Like how when you at the swimming pool on the hottest day of the summer, you jump in and it's cool. And then you take one step too far and suddenly you're in the deep end and things ain't so cool no more because you can't swim. That's how I felt, like I was drowning like I was filling up with water. Like this place, this weird little room that had saved my life, now felt like it was going to take it. I looked at the corner again, my mind boomeranging back to me, and my mom crouching, crying, wondering if my dad would corner us. My heart began to hammer, just like it did back then. The clock on the wall suddenly seemed to tick louder. I turned back around and beat on the door again, tried to beat a hole through it, balled my hand into a fist and pounded and pounded and pounded, yelling Mr. Charles's name until at last, after what seemed like forever, I could hear him on the other side of the door. Castle, I'm here. His voice came through muffled. Mr. Charles yanked it a few times and each time letting out a weird grunt until finally the door swung open. He stumbled back into the chip display before finally catching his balance. I shot out of the room. Stupid thing gets stuck, he tried explaining, but I couldn't wait to he around to hear about it. One more minute and then I would melt in the aisle between the chips and the soda. So I grabbed my backpack and ran straight for the door. All right, you guys, that's the end of page 98. And you'll hear chapter six tomorrow.